now we're in the teaching lab and we are getting ready to go out into the field. Uh, we're taking an instrument with us today called the CTD, which stands for Conductivity, Temperature, and Depth. And this is a multi-parameter sound. It's made by a company called YSI. So sometimes you'll hear these instruments referred to as a YSI Pro or a YSI Pro multi-parameter sound. All of those things are uh, interchangeable. And before we take this instrument out into the field, what we want to do is we want to calibrate it. So I have a bucket of fresh water here, and what we'll do is we'll turn the instrument on and we'll put the sound uh, into the water to make sure that all the probes are working correctly. And so in order to do this, you have to take off the protective covering which covers the uh, different um, instruments on the bottom of the sound. So in order to do this, you want to be very, very careful because there's sensitive membranes on the bottom of the instruments that protect, uh, protect the instruments and allow them to make accurate readings. And so for storage purposes, there's always a little bit of water, residual water left inside of this protective covering. And that's to keep the membranes moist and make sure that they're working properly. And so for this specific sound, you'll notice that there's three instruments on the bottom of it. This tall one that has uh, the ring around it right here is going to be the dissolved oxygen probe. And if you ever use one of these in the future, you'll know that you have to replace these membranes sometimes and that they're very sensitive and they're easy to rip. Um, so when you're taking the cover on and off, you want to make sure not to disrupt that, otherwise it can rip. This probe here is the temperature and um, conductivity probe. And of course, temperature is self-explanatory. Conductivity is going to measure um, the specific conductance of how many ions are actually in the water. And this last probe is the pH probe. So you can buy more expensive probes that have different uh, instruments on them and can give you all sorts of different water quality parameters. It just depends on um, your needs for the study that you're doing. So this is the actual in-field um, cover that goes over the probes. It has holes in it, unlike the other one. This just allows water to come back through and actually hit the sensors to give you your measurements. So if you don't have this one on, uh, you won't actually get any measurements. So I'm just going to put this on really slowly as to not disrupt that membrane like I mentioned earlier. Screw it on, make sure it's nice and tight, and then you can put it in the fresh water. Now what this does is this gives us a baseline for our, um, for our sensors so that we know when we're in the field uh, what baseline to measure again. So if it's fresh water, it's going to have a really neutral pH, it's going to have uh, no salinity, it's going to have room temperature, uh, temperature. So in order to make sure that this works correctly, this calibration step, we're also going to um, bubble the water and saturate it with oxygen. And this is important for making sure the dissolved oxygen is measuring the baseline, which should be 100% oxygen saturation. So let's turn the instrument on and look at some of the parameters that we can measure here. So these will vary a little bit dependent on um, the company that you're going through or uh, the amount of sensors that are on the instrument, but power button will start the instrument. And there's going to be a couple of menus here. This is pretty much like a, a primitive computer, if you will, where there's going to be different um, system settings, there's going to be file logs where you can access previous information recorded from the instrument. And for now, we're just going to ignore all that and we're just going to actually run this on the top option. It will stabilize and then produce a screen that shows all of our different parameters that we can actually get from this instrument. The first thing here is showing is the time and the date. It's showing our ambient temperature right around 23 and a half degrees centigrade. Next value is going to be our specific conductance and that's measured in microsiemens per centimeter cubed, I believe. Um, then we also have our salinity, which is going to be um, 0 0.35. So there's some you know, residual um, sodium chloride in this water, or probably just left over from the membranes um, from our last sampling trip. And what you'll notice is that the oxygen is not at 100% saturation. And that's because we just put the um, aerator in the water and we have to allow this some time to calibrate. It's typically about an hour. 
One other question, where does it measure depth? So depth is going to be, um, the depth probe on here is actually above where the parameters are, or the, the sensors rather. And it's right here, it's this little circle. So when you're, when you're taking your um, depth or pressure measurements at the surface, you can't just place the probe this far into the water so that the sensors are covered. You have to make sure that this, the depth and pressure sensor is also covered. So just a couple things about this instrument when you get into the field. It is expensive and you want to make sure that you don't lose or damage any of the equipment. So you want to make sure that everything um, has its safety, has a safety net essentially. And for the computer, this comes in this little form of a little clip here, has a screw attachment. Um, this will allow it, you know, so if this thing uh, comes detached, the main cable, then this will be the, the safety cable. And you'll find the same thing on the sonde itself, where off the main chute of the, the main cable, we have the safety clip. And this is really important because if you get to the bottom of your sampling site and you lose a couple thousand dollar probe, your boss is going to be quite mad at you, so make sure that doesn't happen. Um, it's also important how you deploy these instruments yourself. So, for example, if you're going to th uh, toss this over the side of a boat, well, don't do that. Don't toss it over the side of the boat. Don't, um, you, you don't want to grab it by the cable here and just kind of chunk it over. You want to grab it by the base of the sonde itself and hold it by the cable and slowly lower it down into the water column. And then same thing for retrieval. You want to slowly lift it up so it doesn't knock and hit the side of the boat and possibly damage the sonde. Um, I, think, I think that's about it. All right, so this is the plankton net we're going to be using, or one of the plankton nets we're going to be using on the Katy today. And so I just want to tell you a little bit about how this works and some of the different parts. And so obviously, this rope is attached here and will be attached to the boat as we lower it into the water and drag it through the water. There's a couple things you always want to take note of with plankton nets, and that's um, one of them is the opening size of this, right? Because we want to know how much water we're pulling through to actually calculate how much plankton per density or volume of water. And so this net is a half meter wide, so 50 centimeters. And the other thing you want to notice is the mesh size of the net itself. And so this is a very fine mesh, it's 20 microns. And so this is going to be targeting mostly phytoplankton. And of course we'll catch larger things in it as well, but it'll definitely get those smaller phytoplankton bits. Um, so we have our net opening, and it goes back down into the water, filters things through, and then collects things in here. And this is called the cod end of the plankton net. And so it's just a canister here where water can flow through and filter out any of those organisms you want to keep. So when we pull it up, we'll wash down the net to get all the bits into this cod end. We can unscrew it and then dump it in a bucket and collect our samples. What is the end called? Cod end. Why? I'm not sure. But it is. All right, guys, I think we're about ready to go, but I like to go through every step of our procedures before we actually head out and make sure we have all our equipment, right? Okay, so what we're gonna do, first thing is we're going out to the channel, right? And we're gonna do a sonde, a CTD cast. So we have the sonde, right, Hunter? Okay, and then you checked the batteries on that? I did, yes. Okay, and you calibrated it? Correct, calibrated okay. it in the lab. Perfect, we're ready. So we're gonna do a sonde cast with a CTD measurement of the channel. And then what are we going to do after that? We're going to do a Secchi, right? Do we have the Secchi? Yes, we do. All right. Perfect. And then we're going to do our two plankton toes. So that is the small net, right? OK, so we'll do that. And do we have bottles to put the samples in? Yes. One, two, three, and one more. Four, because we're going to do one small mesh net and one large mesh net at each station, right? Okay, we're good there. And then we are going to do what? Our trawl, right? Yes. Okay. And so we have that. We have our data sheets, our clipboard, lots of extra rubber bands, because these will always break. Special. And you can't have too many pencils. <laughs> if I hadn't dined for every time I lost a pencil underwater, I'd be rich. 
Okay. And we have our data sheets ready to go. Is there anything else we need right now? What are we going to do when we get the trawl up? We're going to ID fish, all right? So we have our ID book, and we're going to measure them. Do we have the measuring boards? I think they might be in the cabin. You want to check, Hunter? What if we get a fish or an animal that's too big for the measuring board? Are we prepared for that? Good question. I was thinking of that, and I was going to get one of those long tapes, and I forgot, but this is field work. We do have this sucky line that actually has measurements on it for measuring the depth, and we can use that to measure the fish. Awesome. Which is a prime example of how you roll with punches when you're doing field work. <laughs> okay, so I think we have all our equipment, right? We have everything we need to take data down. Do we need anything else you guys can think of? Our positive attitudes. Positive attitudes, we need that. We need uh, water. Yeah, got water. We need coffee, essential, even though it's hot out. Still need coffee. We took off our wedding ring. I actually have a very funny story about this. My wife doesn't think it's quite as funny, but it is. Um, and we got some food. All right, I think we're ready to go. Let's do it. Awesome. Alright guys, so we are at our first sampling location. We are here in the Corpus Christi shipping channel. We're going to get our water quality data and we're going to sample for plankton. Now you guys are going to be putting in your sonde and your secchi discs um, to get that water quality data. But before you put anything in the water, you need to get permission from Captain Chad just so he knows what you're doing. So make sure you get his attention, give a thumbs up. If he returns that thumbs up, you can go ahead and put that piece of equipment in the water. Any questions before we get started? No. Good. All right. meters right now. Derek, with all your ship channel work, what do you what's your guess as the bottom temperature? Bottom I mean the bottom depth. Bottom depth? Uh, it's it's gonna be probably 54 and a half feet. What's give that? Or, meters. Give, give meters man, meters! I'm gonna convert. I was stalling <laughs> for my conversion. <laughs> Let's see, so that's like maybe 16 meters, 17 meters, yeah, roughly. Do you go slow? How deep is it, Chad? 57. 57 feet, so that's, yeah, like 17, 18 meters. Should be, should be pretty close. You can check my conversion at home. Okay, so right now we're at 17.14 meters. Our temperature is 30.15. Salinity is 22.58. Our DO is 100%. Seems high. Our pH is 7.52. Let me see it, Derek. Get a shot of the, a 
hope you can read this. Well, I can't see it, so I assume I am. Oh. All right, guys, so now we're ready to get started sampling for plankton. When you put any equipment in the water, you want to make sure that it's secured. So we have a collection cup down here that I've secured on with these little loops. Make sure that that's on there. I'll show you that closer in a bit. And then I've also secured it to the boat with this cable. And I always double check before it goes in the water. You'll do the same with your small plankton toe. We're going to tie that off to a cleat and make sure that it is completely secure before we put it in the water. Now, just like when you were putting in your water quality data, we need to get permission from Chad before putting stuff in the water. So I've already communicated with him that we're, we are ready to sample for plankton, so he knows we're going to start putting those nets in the water. Any questions? Yes. Yes. Have you ever gotten something bigger than plankton in the plankton net? Well, that's kind of a misleading question because plankton does not actually tell us about size, but it tells us about how an organism is in this environment. So plankton uh, actually means to drift or to wander. So plankton can be any size, but typically when we're talking about plankton and we're thinking about plankton, we're thinking about the little guys. Disc. This is a really simple device for measuring water clarity. 
essentially how it works is you have this weighted disc that you put into the water and as it moves down in the column you have measurements on this rope that will tell you how far you can see this these uh these black triangles to and that gives you a measure of the water clarity so what i'll do is i'll just drop this overboard slowly and i will watch the disc until I can't see it anymore. And that will give me my clarity measurement. You can see the disc disappearing slowly. measurement from this mark which was at the water surface to the second disc itself and that is my clarity measurement. It can be useful to take several measures in case there's some sort of plume in the water or take the take the average of your measurements. Maybe do two or three of them. And that, that clarity is really good for the channel. I've been out here when the second depth is only like this much. We got probably over two meters there when we ended up at it. Alright, so we're gonna do our secchi disc measurement for Redfish Bay here. It's quite a bit shallower. So we might hit the bottom. Let's see. Drop it nice and slow. That's about it right there. Got, got the measurement, Derek? 1.1 meters. Uh, all right, so we're here with Captain Chad in the, what do you call this? It's called the wheelhouse. Wheelhouse. All right. So you have all kinds of different instruments here. Can you just kind of tell us a little bit about what you know each one does? Yeah. yeah. Uh, right here, this is our GPS. For this little boat right here, it kind of just shows us where we are in the world. Right now, we're going down the Corpus Christi ship channel. Okay. You know, underneath the boat in real time. Right now, bottom left corner, it's 52 feet. There's not much going on underneath us. <coughs> so the red stuff at the bottom is the sea floor. Yep, yeah. that would be the bottom of the channel right there. So, all right, you got that. This is your VHF radio. Uh, always monitor channel 16. It's an international hailing and distress frequency only channel. So if somebody wants to get a hold of me, they can call me on channel 16. We can communicate how we're going to pass each other here in the ship channel. So you have an uh, unfortunate heart attack, and I have to call for help. What do I do? Uh, just keep it on channel 16, call the Coast Guard, and they'll coordinate with you what they want you to do, where you are. You'll get your information here from the GPS as far as coordinates, and they'll come help so you out. So I just out. say Coast Guard, Coast Guard, Coast Guard? Yep. Uh, well, uh, there's different calls for that. That would be a Mayday call. It's a uh, year. Uh, potential for loss of life or property. So mayday, mayday, mayday. Okay. The other one would be pawn, pawn, pawn. It's not a uh, loss of life. It's just like a pawn, like a chess pawn. P A N. P A N. You say pawn, pawn, pawn. And then security is another call you make, just to let people know if there's like a hazard or something in the area. Okay. So, that's all important stuff to know. Uh, right here, this is AIS. It's an automated identification system. It'll tell me information about other ships in the area. So if I go choose a different ship, it'll tell me which way it's heading, how big it is, all of their MMSI number. I can call them. Wow, that's so, fancy. Yeah, it's all, all good things to have. Just to, pretty much your whole job is don't run into stuff, and it all helps right. you do that. So you're steering with this wheel here. Yep. And your feet. 
steering with well, your feet. That's another, pro, going, that's another pro move. Yeah. Steer with your feet. Lots of practice. Uh, you got your compass, your, your gauges right here, you got RPM, temperature of the engine, uh, oil pressure. This is our alternator output. It shows us what we're charging. And this is the uh, pressure switch for you know, the pressure in the clutch. So you always want to keep an eye on all that stuff. Because this is a single engine boat. If we lose the engine, that's our only engine. That's, that's how we get home. So but why do you have two throttles there? This is the throttle right here. So that's how we go faster okay. and slower. This is our gear shift. So we're in forward gear right now. If I put it up, we'd be in neutral, backwards, reverse. Other than that, that's about it. How fast are we going? Right now we're cruising at about eight knots. And a knot is like, I think, don't quote me on it, but I think it's 1.115 miles per hour. That sounds about right. Yeah. I'm going to go with that. <laughs> it's just a little bit faster than one mile an hour. About a 10% increase. How fast could we go if we really needed to move? This is this is our cruising speed. We don't go too much quicker. <laughs> no, we actually we we got the tide coming in right now, so we're riding it in. I mean, we we usually go about seven knots everywhere we go. But. So fun story. I was uh, on my way back from Honduras. I was living in Honduras and decided to move all my stuff home, and I took a cargo ship from Rotan, Honduras to Tampa Bay, Florida. So we're driving along, about day three. I'm standing on the deck and one of the crew members is there. So I look over to him and I say, hey, how fast are we going? He starts laughing. He's like, five or six knots. I was like, really? He's like, yeah, most boats radio over because they think we're drifting. No. Just can't get in a hurry. As long as you're still moving, it's good. This, this engine has been in the boat since 1981. She's still chugging along. I guess that makes it 29 or 39 years old now, right? so that it doesn't hit the boat, doesn't damage the boat or the equipment. Or you. Or me. Or you. Or me. We're washing the sediment sample from the bucket dredge into these uh, mesh sieves. And then we can sort through our benthic organisms. If you don't have the running water on this sediment, it'll get really clumpy and won't go through the sieve. That's why I'm constantly washing it into the into the mesh. And what sort of animals do you think that you'll find? Well, I've already seen some different types of worms in here. Maybe some shelled organisms. Um, Maybe a starfish if we're lucky. Yeah.
living organism at all. Uh, but it's actually a tube built by a worm called a tube building worm. And that worm is actually inside if it's still there. So what I like to do is have us go ahead and check and see if that worm's there. So by grabbing it on the sides and pulling, open it up and you might see that worm inside its tube. So we can try that with a few others and see if we can find some. Uh, we also have worms that don't build tubes. So we have some of those other guys uh, in here. It's gonna be our brittle sea star. So we get to see these guys quite frequently as well. Now, one thing that I'm noticing and I'm hoping you're noticing in our organisms and on this sheet is that all of these organisms are fairly small. And that's one of their adaptations to live on that sediment type that we just um, sampled. So that sediment is really, really fine. If we were to walk on that kind of sediment, we would just sink down into the bottom. So by being smaller, they weigh a lot less than we do. That helps them walk along that sediment. You'll also notice that they spread out that weight. So our sea star does that by having five arms coming out, each one with a bunch of little tube feet on it. Our worms do it by spreading out their entire body. open 
opens our net top, our side to side. To open it top to bottom, you'll see that there are floats up top that's called the float line. And there's a similar line on the bottom called the lead line with weights on it.
pinfish. Pinfish are notoriously uh, known for doing that. They jump out of your hands. They're very strong for their size, which is pretty neat. Um, and they're called pinfish because of all of those little spines.
is there's three different ways to measure a fish. We can do total length, this is the total length of the fish. We can do fork length, if you want to show up. Can you pick up the fish? So, as you probably know, most fish, or a lot of fish, have this fork tail. And so we will measure the fork length inside that fork. And then there's a third measurement called standard length, which is a little bit trickier. You want to put the fish down. To measure standard length, you measure right where the caudal peduncle starts to bend. So Derek will bend up the tail and use his thumb to mark that place, and then you can see what the measurement is. So this one's standard length is 132. 